it didn't affect uh, other types of computers. But in principle, there's no reason. If they have a bug in a similar code, they could be affected in the same way. Right. I so used a word there, which I should explain. Yes. Which is exploit. So yes. Exploit. Yes. When I say exploit, what I mean is a way of exploiting a problem in the code. So in this case, that file sharing uh, SMB code had a bug in it, and you, and the the program was able to exploit that to take over that computer. And am I right in saying that this um, exploit was originally written uh, by the um, the uh, United States Security Services? I think the NSA. Yeah. Uh, so that that's the current opinion it, it looks very almost certain that that's what happened that uh, so the so just the to, to try and put a timeline together in our heads so basically this like all programs there are there are bugs um and some of those bugs affect uh things like this and allow this kind of uh, exploit um so at some point in the past we don't know when um this bug uh was written in the code and then at some point after that um, it looks very much like uh, someone at the NSA discovered this bug um, and then they did some work on working out how to use it in order to take over computers. So right. not, obviously not all bugs can allow you to take over computers um, and if they do allow you, it, that can be tricky. So what the people at the NSA did was not just find the problem but also find a way of exploiting the problem to take over computers. And that's, to me... That's pretty irresponsible because I know that the NSA are in the business of snooping and, you know, doing exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about. But really, what they should have done, in my view, is told Microsoft that they'd found this defect and they should fix it. But actually, they wanted to use it for their own purposes, which is to snoop, to spy on people. Mm, yeah, so, um, they, yeah, uh, having a, a balanced opinion on, it, on this is difficult, right? So on the one hand... Um, the the job of people like the NSA and also GCHQ who would have shared this um, technology uh, is to listen in to what people are doing, preferably in ways that they uh, that they don't know about. Now, you, you might think that that's just a completely illegitimate job and they should never do that. But if you accept that um, that that is something that it is justified to happen at least sometimes. They need ways of doing it. So what they've done is they've figured out a way of doing it, which just so happens to be uh, also useful to criminals. Mm. Like pretty much everything that the NSA figures out is also could be useful to criminals. So what happened is, A, they found this problem and figured out how to exploit it and chose not to tell um, the people who wrote the software, which in this case was Microsoft, uh, and there was a blog post, I think today or yesterday, by a, a very senior person in Microsoft saying um, that they really should have told Microsoft rather than keeping it secret. So this is not a completely, this is not a kind of obscure uh, hippie viewpoint that they should have revealed this information to Microsoft. This Dude, is something that are you calling me an obscure hippie? <laughs> no, I think <laughs> I, I might sometimes be accused of being an obscure hippie. So. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so there are people, I mean, in this case, Microsoft were, were hit by this problem, but um, mm. um, it, it's widely believed in the security community that um, uh, when you find a problem like this, the only ethical thing to do is to report it to the, uh, the person who wrote the software. Um, and then what's, then what's then generally accepted as well by these people is that if that person doesn't react very well or helpfully, you're then okay to publish it on the internet to sort of shame them into taking action. And which, that's, the, that's the kind of normal pattern. Which you do see a lot of that kind of thing happening. Well, not a lot, but you do see it happening when yes. somebody finds uh, a defect in something and, uh, as you say, the person responsible gets a bit defensive about it, then they post it and say, look, this person's clearly an idiot. Yeah. So the, the, it's in everyone's interest that, that, that good guys try and hack into systems and then tell people in a responsible way about the problems they find. Yep. Because if not, it's only going to be bad guys and the bad guys aren't going to tell anyone. So the, the general pattern is you find a problem and you report it to someone and they, they either pay you because they have a kind of um, bounty system in place where they, they, they're looking, they're bug hoping bash. people will tell them stuff. Yeah, bug bash. Yeah. yeah. Or or they publish, they, they publish the, you know, their... 
they they release a fix for the problem and then they publish your name saying you know thanks to this incredibly clever person who found the problem and that that helps your career or it helps your company that you work for build its reputation as a you know security company or something you know there's there's some reward in it for the the good guys and so if the company instead of all that just brushes it under the carpet and says don't tell anyone there has to be some other reward for the good guys so what they do is they put it up on the internet saying you know this irresponsible yeah. company has ignored me when i told them about a problem <laughs> anyway that's a sidetrack um okay so, so um i've got another question what? before Go before we move on um there was somebody who claims to have put a stop to it yeah today what did that did i see that news uh, item today no, i think it happened on friday friday okay so what's um, what's that all about was, who is this person a, and, only a few hours after it all kicked off it was yeah. so the, this person is one of the good guys right so his job is to uh research um this kind of malicious program figure out how to stop it uh either in the kind of long-term ways of kind of filtering it out so it can't get in or in very short-term ways of actually trying to kill it off um and so one of the key things that they do um people like this is that they figure out how the program works and how it's spreading so he had managed to get hold of a copy of the program which is not too hard because Either you you can look at it on someone's computer who's who's been infected, or what they normally do is they set up so-called honeypot servers that yes. um, that that appear to be a vulnerable computer, but actually um, they're not. It's not going to do any harm if they get infected because they're isolated away from I think, the rest of the. Internet. I think the Russians do the same kind of thing with British MPs. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure I read a book about that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, the yeah, so uh, he got hold of a copy of the virus. So he was looking at the code of the virus. Uh, he was looking at the code in machine code because he's that hardcore. Yeah. And so he was reading the machine code code of the program, which is like extremely incomprehensible numbers. Uh, and he figured out from reading that, actually from the assembly language, but it's effectively the same thing. It's, yeah, it's hardcore. Um, he figured out from reading the code that it was trying to go to a particular website, a particular domain name, just a load of numbers and letters, you know, not an actual domain name that you'd recognise. Um, so they, it's kind of standard practice. So people think that he was kind of really lucky because he, he decided to do it. But it's actually it's completely standard practice, he says, for them. When they find uh, a URL like that, a domain name, in the code of a, um, a malicious programme, they will go and register it if it's not already been registered. Um, because it gives them information about wh what computers are infected, because if these computers are trying to get to that domain name, um, you'll see them when they connect, and so on. So it's completely normal to register a domain name that you find in in the code of a virus like that. Uh, so he went he went ahead and did that, because then he could find out you know where it's who, who it's infected and where and what's happening, and. Uh, it turned out, he didn't realise this at the time until they analysed the code further, but it turned out that actually just by registering that domain name, it stopped the virus operating. Right. Um, uh, it stopped it from continuing to do its work. So the initial, just a little sideline about that, the initial opinion about that was that this was a so-called kill switch, as in something that the virus writers had put in deliberately so that if things got out of hand, they could stop it working i see but uh they, that's almost certainly wrong he says um because why would you why would they do that really that it just makes it too easy for someone else to stop it <clears throat> um so he believes the reason why that code was in there was because the virus was actually trying to hide its uh behavior from people trying to study it so this is apparently a fairly normal practice that when you when you're studying a program like this, you get you keep it in an isolated environment, and one of the things you do in that environment is you make it look like any website that it asks for actually does exist. So what the virus writers had done had said, if it if this website that I know doesn't exist appears to exist, I must be being studied by a researcher. Uh, I see. So stop. And therefore, <laughs> I won't do my behaviour. So they can't figure out how I work. Right. So now all these all these programs all around the world now think they're in a, a laboratory being studied and they have therefore turned themselves off. <laughs> but they're so still So we running. got kind of lucky. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, they're still yeah the machines themselves are still infected and the files are still encrypted, but it's not spreading. Okay, so, so we were quite we got quite lucky that he 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 followed that process and it, it so had that effect. It's not spreading. Um, if your computer hasn't been affected, which hopefully it hasn't, uh, what can you do to protect yourself from it? So the first thing to say, just in terms of how it's saying it's not spreading, it I, that particular version is not spreading anymore because of this change. But it will be extremely easy for the people who wrote this program, or actually anyone else, to adapt it so that it works differently and then release it again. Right. So we, we shouldn't think that it's all over. It could well be... We could see another outbreak of essentially the same thing uh, this week. Yeah. Or in future. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what, can you, what can we do to protect do? ourselves? So the there are there are two things that are crucially important and i would say one is more important than the other so the the most important thing is keep your computer up to date yeah so when you've got updates from microsoft or whoever makes your operating operating system or the other programs on your computer when they say you we need an, we need to update make sure it's really them right make sure it's not some malicious website <laughs> yeah. but it once you're sure it's really them who's saying you need to update do it straight away. Do it just as quick as you can. This this um, bug in the uh, the networking code in Windows uh, had been a fix for it had been released one month before uh, this all happened. Right. So anyone who had updated their Windows system in the last month uh, would already have the fix and therefore wouldn't get the problem. So one of the problems that people on the news have been talking about with the NHS is that some, not that many, not half as many as people have been saying, but some of the program, some of the computers used by the NHS uh, have Windows XP on, which is an old version of Windows, which no longer has any updates from Yeah, Microsoft. that's right. They stopped in 2015. And yeah. therefore, you didn't, if you're using Windows XP, you didn't get an update yeah. to protect you from this problem. Okay. Um, however, as a special... Uh, you could say a special favor, or you could say to protect themselves. Microsoft have actually released a fix for this problem for Windows XP, even though they don't support Windows XP and they, uh, they're they trying to get people to move off it. This has been such a serious problem that they have actually now okay. retrospectively released a fix. So to, okay, so to, that sort of deals with the Windows XP issue, but there have been plenty of other large companies around the world that have been, been affected by this. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, I think we maybe have to assume that they're not using Windows XP. Are we? Uh, is it then the case that they haven't patched those machines, they're not up to date, uh, which is why yeah. it's, it's managed to spread? And well, yeah, it, so it, th there's two ways that it will spread. One is by exploiting this problem that we've talked about. And the other is, if the machine is already infected by uh, because of some other cause, yeah. what it does, as soon as it affect, infects a computer, it actually opens up another way of letting uh, the virus in. And I, I'm not clear on the details of that, but so that that's the second thing. And what's interesting about that is that that's one of the main reasons why um, we can identify that this uh, this. Uh, it is using code that came from the NSA because the, there was a leak of code from the NSA a couple of months ago, I think, um, or, or so that people claimed was from the NSA. And given that no one has really denied it, I think we we can be pretty clear that that, that did come from the NSA. Yeah. Um, and that code included this other part, this uh, this second backdoor that the the the, the, um, the malicious code opens, so that even if your system is fixed. With the original bug, if that backdoor's already been installed, it will allow in um, the malicious code in a different way. I see. Okay. So on the point of uh, the NSA, by the way, the um, what's I going to say about that? The yeah. So the the question in, in terms of the ethical question for the NSA and for GCHQ is what they're effectively what they've done is they've developed what you, what is effectively a weapon. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a way of um, damaging or spying on um, uh, people all around the world. Um, and what they've then done is allowed that weapon effectively to be stolen. It's a lot easier to steal computer programs than it is... A physical uh, chemi weapon. Yeah. Chemical weapons or yeah. something like that. Um, so, 
uh, it's very, very hard to secure them. So, the, you know, the ethical question becomes, should you develop weapons like that at all, given the risk of them being stolen? Or can you put in place sufficient uh, controls to prevent them being stolen that you can prevent the kind of bad effects of other people finding out about them? Yes. So that's, that's one, one. one part of the ethical question. The other part of the ethical question is, of course, if I could find this bug... Someone else could find this bug as well independently. Yes, quite. It's not just yeah. if the weapons get stolen. Yeah. So should I defend? Is it the is the patriotic thing to do, to defend um, uh, your own country's software by reporting problems like this to the people who wrote the programs? Mm. It is a it is a tricky question. You, know, you could make the analogy about North Korea and their nuclear program. In that. <coughs> You know, they've developed their rockets and their nuclear program completely independently from the rest of the world. Um, and in the way that you say that if somebody can find an exploit, then somebody, then you could find it. Another programmer mm -hmm. could find it. The NSA, mm -hmm. you know, if the NSA hadn't developed this, somebody else might have done. Mm -hmm. um, it's the fact that they did, and they're a government agency that that is the thing that yeah. you know. That yeah, you know, I think that the person from Microsoft saying that they have a responsibility to report it to them mm -hmm. it is I an interesting conundrum because it is. I mean, the, the British know. and American governments had it within their power to prevent this from ever happening, and they chose not to use that information yep. to defend their country against yeah. this attack. And then this happened, which uh, you know, in my view, makes them look like chumps, but. If this hadn't happened, then we wouldn't know, even know about it, and they'd be quite happily spying on the countries that they're interested in spying on, and nobody would be any the wiser. Yeah, and bear in mind also that um, uh, the people who exploit this may well be as covert as the NSA in the way they use it. So uh, yeah. cr both criminals and uh, other governments might well be exploiting problems like this in a very widespread way, but not in a way that's visible in the way that this particular uh, attack was. Did we mention its name, by the way? No, what is its name? It's it's variously called Wanna Cry or variants of that. Ah, uh, yes. No, I did hear that. Wanna Cry, yeah. And I think cry means... Uh, in, like, because it encrypts, like crypt. Yeah. Crypt. Yeah. Crypt, yeah. Like, uh, because it encrypts your files. Which, by the way, we haven't said what that is. We should probably briefly mention that. Mm, okay, I, I think I'd like to move on to a, to a related subject Go before, on before we wrap this up. And the, the, a film came out last year called Zero Day. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out in 2016. It's all about the Stuxnet virus mm -hmm. that was a self-replicating form of malware um, very similar to this, which also affected, coincidentally, also affected Windows computers. Yes, that's right. And this uh, this virus, this Stuxnet virus, originated um, again, I think, possibly with the NSA, possibly with another American security service, and it was originally written to be delivered to Iranian um, nuclear um, centrifuges to basically break them so they wouldn't run yes. uh, but it ended up with somebody else who modified it to um to be a piece of malware uh, so it's this is just a little bit of history repeating very much so yeah this is why i suddenly thought when i've when i've heard that it was had been developed by the nsa i was like well this has happened before you know the the, the security services had previous form on this <laughs> yeah. and who I mean, else are... you know who knows what else is out there waiting to um, to cause this kind of havoc? Yeah, a certain section of the technology community has always uh, been of the view, not only that the people like the NSA are just bad guys, but also that the only responsible thing to do when you find a vulnerability is report it. Yeah. Um, but to see um, an institution like Microsoft come out so strongly with that position, mm. I know it's them who was attacked, but still. Uh, it was surprising to me. I wonder whether they will have the ear of the um, legislature more than more than just some technology researchers. Well, they're a big, powerful organisation. I, mean, I mean, they're not as influential as they used to be, but um, I should imagine that 
you know, they, they employ a significant number of people around the world. They employ a significant number of people in the United States. I should think that they do have some kind of bargaining or at least lobbying power in Washington to get things yeah. changed. Yeah, and I, and I think this problem has also been a demonstration of how important their operating system is to the world's infrastructure. Right? Yes. The, they are easily the majority... Windows is easily the majority operating system around the world. Mm. And they they understand their responsibility, the, the responsibility that that gives them, um, but they're arguing that other people, governments, should also understand their their responsibility with respect to defending that system. Totally. I'm with them on that one. But I do also, I do, I do understand the, the viewpoint of the security services wanting an open back door into uh, computers in that way. I think that, you know, I was just thinking that maybe there's a conversation that could have been had between the NSA and Microsoft saying, we found this thing, we want to keep it open. Is there a way that we can keep it open without compromising anything? Um, and then, but then I suppose you're looking at collusion between the security services and Microsoft, who are a private company, um, which is to me even more insidious. But that you know that that may already exist anyway. Who who the hell knows? Yeah. The, so the other argument that's being made on the sidelines of this is about um, opinions that various people have given recently that um, strong encryption basically shouldn't be allowed. So there should be no. Uh, some of the, some UK Conservative Party politicians have been saying there shouldn't be any conversation that can be had online that can't be listened in. <laughs> so yeah, what but would, would they want their? Presumably, they yeah. want to keep their encryption, right? <laughs> well, you may or may not agree with them, but I, um, the it's just from a practical point of view. What they're effectively talking about is deliberately putting um, a vulnerability into any encryption that's used right. that can be exploited by the security services. But, but that could and then I be exploited the, by somebody else, that, as we've seen. Exactly. So know. I think one of the lessons that we, we, we have to learn from, the, uh, from WannaCry is not only that so other people might find any vulnerability you have, but in particular, the information is quite likely to leak yeah. uh, and people will find out in a very direct way, like, it, like they did in this case. Well, yeah, all you need is a disgruntled employee who's offered some Bitcoin by somebody who's got a st who wants to exploit it, and uh, then the code is with somebody else, and they can use it for their own ends. So I yeah. don't agree yeah. with that point of view. I think that mm -hmm. there was a, I think there was a uh, it was a headline in the Register which said this was back when uh, Obama was president. Do you remember that when Obama was president and uh. you know. Life was good. That was, um, but yeah. uh, there was a headline which read, I think, he, I think he was at South by Southwest last year. And uh, the headline read, President Obama puts down his encrypted phone for long enough to tell us to stop using encryption. <laughs> Which I thought was, I mean, and every time a politician brings it up, mm. I just think, you A, you probably don't understand what you're talking about. And it's double standards because there's no way that you're going to remove the encryption from your device and hand over the keys so that people can snoop on it. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, I think the thing... It, this, this, reminds, this debate reminds me a little bit of climate change in that it, some people try and provide like a, like a balanced viewpoint of, of both sides, but the fact is that 99.9% .9 of scientists, especially scientists who work in the area, uh, think that humans have caused significant changes in the climate and so on and so on in a similar way 99.9% .9 of people who have a clue about security think it's insane to deliberately put a vulnerability into yeah your protocols because someone will exploit it and they're right as well I think they're right they're right they are right okay uh, I think I think from the questions that you asked me to ask you <laughs> I think I, I think that's it. That was very yeah, that was so very good actually. There was a little bit of um, uh, misinformation from some parts of the media who didn't understand. For example, the poor bloke who who was up for like thirty six hours without any sleep, yeah, and actually caused the 
caused the virus to stop operating and found out masses of important information about how to stop it um, was was described as being as playing around on the internet when he found it oh, was actually what he was doing was doing his job yeah which is fighting cyber crime like Batman he's like Batman he's like and Batman. then he was described as like the um, lucky like what do they what do they call him like a hero but only by luck type it was the implication whereas actually yeah okay yeah, but this anyway, is from people who, who don't have a clue so we, we must cut them a little bit of slack for that and then but, there were all kinds of other things being said like like all the computers in the NHS are running Windows XP which is rubbish. which is not true there's a whole, there's a whole load of rubbish talks but anyway yeah. hopefully we've hopefully we haven't said too many things that were wrong I did try and check out from some primary sources some of this stuff before we talked tonight. So I don't think I we have remembered it wrong. And I think that, you know, for, for the intended audience of this, which is, you know, my face, my Facebook friends and people on mm-hmm. Twitter. Uh, hello, th- intended audience. Hello, intended audience. Of um, one. We hope, yes, our listener. Hope, <laughs> actually, yes, let's just wind that back and say our <laughs> listener will mm-hmm. hopefully get something out of this. And, you know, <clears throat> I think that for, for people at home, who've been looking at their Windows machine and maybe haven't turned it on since last week. Mm -hmm. If it's up to date, you know, if you've got the patch from last month, then you're okay. Yeah, you should be okay. If you haven't got the patch, I honestly don't know what to do. Um, I guess that what you should do, if you're really worried... If your file sharing is not on, then it's not a problem then, is it? Well, I'm not sure how you would easily check whether it's listening on that port. Um, do you know what I would see, do? Uh, do you know what do you know what I would do? I would turn off the. <clears throat> I would um, <clears throat> if it's a laptop, it's probably got a hard switch to turn off the wireless. Yeah, or turn off the router. Unplug. Turn off the router. Yeah, hardcore. Yeah. Turn yeah. the computer on. Check and see on Windows. You can check and see when you last installed updates. And if it was last week, then yeah, you're up okay. to date. And then it, 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 this leads me very conveniently onto the second thing. You know, I said there were two things. Yeah. The first thing was up update. Always update as quickly as you can, especially your Windows updates uh, or equivalent on other operating systems. Um, but the second thing is make backups mm. and and check that your backups can be restored. Uh, because if someone if you if someone locks up your computer. Um, it, it's likely that you won't get those files back. But if you've got a backup, you can wipe the computer completely so the virus is gone. And restore a backup. And restore the backup, and, and you you will be absolutely fine. Yeah. You'll lose, uh, you know, however many days work, depending how often you back up. But you'll be back. You'll be absolutely fine. But if you have no backups, then you have to wipe. You it basically lost completely. everything. Yeah. And I really wouldn't pay the people because you ain't going to get it back. In no, the you, majority of cases, no. they're actually they. In the vast majority of cases, they're e- they're lying. They haven't even encrypted your files. Yeah, and it's a ransom. When have we, when have you ever heard of that going well? Yeah, yeah. You no. probably get end up dead in a car park. Yeah. Or your computer will end up dead in a car park. Anyway, yeah. that was awesome. I really enjoyed that. So updates and backups. Yeah, updates and backups. Updates and backups. 